This is episode 214 of the Stem Cell Podcast, ISSCR 2022. 20 years of excellence with Keith Alm, Melissa Little, and Amanda Clark. Hey, everybody. We are Daylon and Arun. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today, we have Keith Alm, CEO of the ISSCR, and doctors Melissa Little and Amanda Clark, who are president and vice president, respectively, of the ISSCR. They're on the podcast to talk about the future of stem cell research and the upcoming annual meeting taking place from June 15th to the 18th in sunny San Francisco. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in stem cell news that's coming right up. But first, stem cell is hiring. Stem cell technologies is a world leader in developing services and tools for scientists working in cell biology, regenerative medicine, immunology, cancer, and disease research. United by a foundation of scientific integrity and driven by a mission to advance science globally, Stem Cell is a team of scientists helping scientists. They're looking for creative driven people to join their international team. Explore more than 100 current offerings in areas such as R&D, sales, business operations, quality, and marketing, all at jobs.stemcell.com. We're going to kick things off with a basic study that's um, kind of... (laughs) mind-blowing in in a lot of ways. It's a new twist on the TCA cycle, the Krebs cycle, right, that we all learn about in biochemistry in undergrad. This is a paper coming out of your neck of the woods over there at MSK, Memorial Sloan Kettering, from Lydia Finley, who's, I believe, a relatively new PI. First author is Paige Arnold. So we all learn about the TCA cycle, right, the tricarboxylic acid cycle, it's a central hub of cellular metabolism. And every year, millions of kids around the world learn about it, right? Med school students, med students have nightmares about this stuff, right? Having to memorize the TCA cycle and all of that. Um, and this is something that's been around for a long time. You know, it's named after Hans Krebs, this German biochemist who discovered it in 1937, you know, a long time ago. It's a central hub of cellular metabolism, right? It's where cells burn sugars to make ATP, which is, of course, the cell's energy carrying molecule. And in its normal form, the cycle actually, of course, you know, occurs in the the mitochondria, the so-called powerhouse of the cell. What the folks here were able to show is there's actually an alternate version of the TCA cycle that actually takes place uh, you know, partly in the mitochondria and also partly in the cytosol. And actually, instead of burning sugar for energy, this alternate version of the TCA cycle actually uses carbons in the sugar to make other molecules like lipids in the cell membranes. And the other thing is, you know, uh, the cell's use of like one or other version of the TCA cycles. Actually, this is the cool part and why it's, you know, we're talking about here on the Stem Cell Podcast, which version you're actually using is associated with the cell's identity. Okay, so there's a version associated with differentiating cells and a version associated with the, the stem cell state. Okay, this is actually a, a cool project that used carbon tracing techniques to actually study the flow of carbons through that TCA cycle into different cell types. Uh, they noticed that there's actually a variation in the extent to which the cells put their carbons in the TCA cycle versus actually skipping one part of it. And they're actually also using some computational methods to analyze some existing data out there uh, where CRISPR was used to knock out genes for different enzymes, different parts of the cycle. Um, And also, you know, so so it's a really cool basic study, but also made me wonder why did it take this long to figure this out? And apparently, uh, you know, looking a little bit deeper into this, uh, uh, Lydia Finley, who's a PI of this paper, she said, that but it it depended on the cell type that Krebs was actually using way back in the day to make some of these seminal discoveries of the original TCA cycle, the original Krebs cycle. He was using pigeon muscle, so uh, which is of course a very specialized cell type, and instead they used uh, different type of cells in this in this study, stem cell populations, to identify something different. So I think it 
the cell type that he was using originally really made a big difference and a big uh, that's the reason why he discovered that ancestral version of this, the Krebs cycle but once they redid some of these experiments in a completely different cell type uh, embryonic stem cells for example they're able to find this alternate version of the TCA cycle so you know I'm not a you know a, a metabolism expert or a biochemist per se but this is cool because it has a stem cell relevant angle perhaps the version of the TCA cycle that the cell is using is entirely dependent on its cell state and of course, as we know, stem cells and embryonic stem cells and all different types of uh, multipotent stem cells are uh, highly variable in their cell state. They're differentiating, of course, and even reprogramming in some instances. And perhaps that basic fundamental biochemistry is different based on the state of the cell and where along that differentiation trajectory the cell is. It's pretty mind-blowing. It's perhaps going to change the the biochemistry books that all the, the med students and the undergrads out there have to read, but uh, I think it's a really beautiful fundamental study. Yes, very fundamental, basic, and important. Um, and yeah, it gets to that point. There's a lot of ways to skin a cat, right? And 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 cells of all the entities, you know, everything sells, I guess. So that's kind of a dumb statement, but cells need to adapt and evolution and over the course of all those eons. Um, there's got to be a lot of ways that you adjust to the changes in your environment and uh, metabolic needs. Um, so yeah, this is kind of, I wouldn't say obvious in retrospect, but I'm kind of smacking my forehead saying, wow, uh, how did we not know this? Or how did we not even have any kind of uh, even a hint to this? Um, and it's as you said, right? Because uh, it all started and everyone is just building on this fundamental insight with the Krebs cycle that was all coming from pigeon muscle. I mean, we got to redo everything now, Arun, is that right? Either way, I think that, uh, you know, as you said, this is really uh, fundamentally important to understanding the metabolic needs of a cell. And we who work in pluripotent stem cells, it's, it's critical, right? These cells are either quiescent or they're ramped up. So energy is a huge factor, also tumor biology, right? So I, th I think there's really broad implications here uh, related to stem cell differentiation, but also targeting of, of tumor cells that are finding a way to obviate, um, you know, the, the pathways that we've targeted to try and uh, slow or stop their metabolism. Maybe there's a the way that these tumor cells are, are getting around that. So I, I think this is important across the board. It's one of those papers that, as I said, everyone's going to now rethink their assays and maybe uh, have another look at, at what we assume to be true. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this falls in line really nicely with a long string of papers that we've been discussing here on the show related to the impact of the metabolism on cell fate. It's not just this alternate TCA cycle. We've talked a lot about the, the role of mitochondria in determining different cell lineages. So this is a white hot field when it comes to the role of metabolism on normal stem cell fate and cancer cell fate. And I'm sure there's a lot we're going to keep uncovering about this in the near future as well. Yes, many, many uh, fruits to come from this fundamental insight and conceptual in advance. And staying with conceptual innovation, I'm going with a, a story here that's in science translational me uh, medicine from our guy who we haven't heard from. And I don't know if he's our guy, but he is everybody's guy when it comes to stem cells. Marius Vernig, who really had a, 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 a seminal impact on our understanding of cell fate and direct differentiation in the neural field. Um, I don't want to say he's been quiet since then, but you know, he had a huge splash and a, a raft of papers related to that and um, many papers derived from that. But now I think he's kind of, I don't want to say switching gears, but this is a story in a different vein. Um, of course, related to neural cell therapy, but I think a really important conceptual innovation that has its roots in the hematopoietic system that I love, Arun. So I couldn't, I really couldn't ignore this story. Um, and it's about neural cell therapy, right? Because of course, uh, it's a scourge, neurodegenerative conditions. Uh, we don't have a lot of options and they're highly prevalent. Um, and the therapies are really attractive because they uh, capture this idea of a cure, right? The single treatment um, that'll reverse or, or mitigate the symptoms of neurodegenerative conditions. Um, and there's been a lot of work done toward that end. My guy, 
uh, I can call him my guy. He's in my neighborhood, Lorenz Studer. <laughs> he's made a huge impact uh, in treat, you know, understanding how we might use cells to as therapy for Parkinson's and other conditions. But you know, it's it's a challenge, right? Because the human brain is huge, and you need to do this stereotactic injection when you're using neural cells as therapy. So it's tough to get a homogeneous distribution of those cells, even if you're using oligos, which are really highly migratory. Um, and even if you're transplanting precursors or progenitors that can differentiate and migrate. So of course we need alternative approaches. And one of the you know, tried and true most robust therapies out there to this day is hematopoietic cell uh, transplantation because it can be delivered to via circulation and home in on the niches where it'll engraft. Uh, and in fact, hematopoietic st uh, stem cell or just cell transplantation is widely used to treat also genetic syndromes um, in the hematological space, of course. Uh, but there's also this idea of using uh, hematopoietic cells to treat central nervous system conditions because uh, hematopoietic cells actually generate these microglia. Uh, but the replacement of brain resident microglia by bone marrow derived cells is really inefficient. And, and because it's so inefficient, it hasn't really been studied as a therapeutic avenue. Um, and most of the time, the microglia are actually regenerated from within the brain, right? So there's two kind of issues there. One is how do you deliver uh, cells to the brain in a way that's efficient? Or how can you deliver compounds to the brain that would activate those brain resonant microglia. But there's a challenge both there because the, any kind of therapy delivered to the brain, either through migration uh, or delivery of cells or uh, traversing the blood brain barrier that can be a challenge, um, stand in the way uh, of gaining access there. So what Vernig's group did here is they, uh, they established this system and characterized the mechanism by, wh by which it works where they get near complete, and here's the key, homogeneous replacement of microglia uh, in mice using bone marrow derived cells without any genetic manipulation of either the cells or the host, right? So, you know, Jun Wu and all these other uh, studies that have looked at replacing the heart, for instance, in like an NKX deficient mouse, for example, didn't have to do any of that. Um, so it's a, it's a big deal. Uh, and they showed the mechanism, how it works, that it wasn't about the, uh, the cells or enhanced recruitment um, from the periphery. It was actually an advantage, an intrinsic advantage that the donor cells had uh, during the repopulation. They also showed that it wasn't the myeloid or monocyte progenitor cells that could do this. You needed to have the hematopoietic stem cells themselves. So that's really a key insight because it's clearly somewhere along the trajectory that this capacity is retained or amplified to, to home and migrate to the brain. And then, of course, this is science translational, right? So they applied this approach in a mouse model of a pro prosapicin deficiency. I didn't know that that was a thing, but it is. Uh, and they modeled it in mice. Um, it's, it's characterized by a progressive neurodegenerative phenotype. And they found using this approach that they could reduce the gliosis and the neurodegeneration in these mice. And here, here it is, improve the, the motor and balance imp impairment and extend the lifespan of these mice. So I, I don't know about you, Arun, but I'm blown away by this idea of a hematopoietic stem cell transplant um, that can have a robust effect in the, in the neurodegenerative condition um, and, you know, this, I guess, establishes that not just for this prosapicin, but obviously has implications for multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, even cardiac ischemic reperfusion injury has the involvement of microglia. So I think this is a fundamental conceptual advance and in innovation that has really strong clinical implications. I would love to hear your take on it. Arun. Yeah, this is really cool. I, I agree with you. I am excited by this in part because the the range of applications for for microglia and you know microglia based therapy uh, not only with neurogeneration but also potentially with some cardiac issues as you're mentioning certainly the caveat is the obvious one this is a, a mouse study and it'll be cool to see how well a lot of this holds up in human clinical trials i'm sure there's something they're thinking about 
Um, one other thing to consider is the long-term effects of some of this microglia replacement uh, approaches, right? I mean, for mice, their lifespan is obviously much shorter than humans, but for humans, we want to have a long-term solution to some of these diseases. So certainly that's going to be a, a major next step for some of this work. And also just something to consider, you know, a lot of the approaches here involve immunosuppression, and that's also something you would have to consider for a, a long-term experiment. And just how successful would this be, not only across species, but over time? I think this is stuff they're, of course, thinking about, and really exciting study, nonetheless. I agree. I mean, absolutely, this is a science translational story. But you know, I think it's it's a it's a major uh, gulf that needs to be crossed, and to apply this to humans, because you know the authors led with this idea: the brain is big, um, and you know, as you said, humans live a lot longer than mice. Um, so the the translation of this translational story to real bedside application is going to be, I think, a long road. But again, I just want to emphasize the conceptual advance because. For a long time, we've appreciated this idea of hematopoietic cells generating microglia and having the potential to contribute to therapies in that space. And here we are, the first, I think, strong story um, underscoring that potential. So uh, I think it's been a long time coming, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes. Good stuff coming from the Vernig Lab. Much more than just transdifferentiation in the Vernig Lab, a lot of other amazing neuroscience stuff and papers coming out recently as well. And we're gonna, we're going to stay something uh, pretty translational. We're going to talk about CAR T, which is certainly a very hot topic these days in clinical medicine and immuno oncology, for example. This is a paper coming out of the City of Hope. Last author is Christine Brown. Uh, and it's a <laughs> paper that really intersects with a lot of different topics that we like to talk about here on the show. Just listen to this title. 3D organoid culture supports differentiation of human CAR iPSCs into highly functional CAR T cells. We got iPSCs, we got CAR T, we got 3D organoid culture, we got a little bit of everything here. It's, uh, it's got something for everyone. Now, CAR T is nothing new. This has been talked about for a long time now. If, the unlimited generation of this chimeric antigen receptor CAR T cells from iPSCs is kind of the holy grail. And a lot of biotech companies have been working on this. A lot of basic science folks have also been working on this. This is uh, the idea behind off the shelf CAR T immunotherapy, right? You just pop some iPS derived CAR T off the shelf and put them into someone in the hopes of having a robust anti tumor response there, right? But it's not been perfect. And in part because the, the approach is to actually make some iPSCs into these canonical T cell lineages while maintaining the expression of the chimeric antigen receptor or CAR is it, it hasn't been perfect. And functionality is another part of it. Okay. Uh, but here they actually showed that their iPSCs that are reprogrammed from a certain type of CD62L positive, naive, and memory T cells, actually followed by some of their engineering approaches of a CD19 car, uh, specifically using a 3D organoid differentiation approach, actually made iPSC-derived CAR T cells with much better characteristics. So they're able to uh, show a bunch of advantages in terms of their cytotoxicity, their cytokine secretion, uh, overall expression of the CAR, um, which is way better apparently than the conventional CD19 CAR T cells. And the uh, T cell receptors also, you know, express there pretty, pretty robustly. It's got, most important thing is anti-tumor activity in vivo, very strong anti-tumor activity uh, from these iPSC derived CD19 CAR T cells. Um, and long-term survival of, of mice, like what we were talking about, long-term survival is the key. And uh, after having human tumor xenografts introduced into some of these mice, actually, you know, it's treating these mice with these iPS-derived CD19 CAR T cells uh, was able to facilitate survival of their mice for, for a very long period of time, okay? So this is great. It's a new methodology. It's a, it's a method. It's kind of a methods paper, right? How to make these highly functional CAR T cells from a 3D organoid culture. Uh, and the hope is, yeah, again, to make some of these off the shelf therapies a reality. 
Um, it'll be cool to see the next step for this. And I'm sure there are patents, IPs, uh, startup companies in the works here. Because, uh, you know, if you're talking about IPS derived CAR T, that's a very, very <laughs> lucrative field these days, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. And it's a race. I mean, people have been grinding on this for so long. And, you know, there have been some, I think, seminal moments, but just, you know, generating the first CAR T and then actually making T cells from IPS cells. It's been a long road to getting to this point where you can get these organoid derived. And of course, it would take an organoid. We could have predicted that. But I, I think the, the bottom line here is that we've uh, created a, not we, uh, this group and, and others have created this really uh, faithful facsimile of the, the on lodge that generates T cells in vivo. Um, and, you know, as you would expect, they're more functional, but the implications here are huge. As you said, it's, it's cancer. And we talk a lot about CAR T, but we've also talked recently about these kind of the, the, the switching, you know, or the switches, these kind of circuits that you can generate in cells so that they um, have closed systems. You know, we talked about this in the last show using auxins and and, but the, the point I'm trying to make here is that the engineering of cells has reached, I think, the pinnacle where we're creating things that look less and less like the native T cell and more and more like a biological machine that we can use toward therapeutic ends. And I'm talking about not just targeting tumor cells, but delivery. You know, imagine delivering any therapeutic compound or biological uh, molecule to, to any niche within the body. I think that these are the type of of systems that are going to get us there yeah absolutely it's synthetic biology in a way it's something we've been talking a lot on the show and you can think about these applications way beyond car t like what you're alluding to what if we can generate some sort of master cell type some sort of master anti-tumor anti-fibrosis cell type that can eliminate whatever population of cells that you're interested in looking at simply by the expression of certain like a certain antigen uh, on the cell types right and i refer back to a story that we talked about a few months ago where they're able to engineer some uh, some version of car t that actually targeted fibrosis in the heart and was able to alleviate that so i think there are a lot an unlimited number of applications for this type of work especially based on the all the cool new methodologies that are coming out in synthetic bio and of course genome editing to really make these stem cell derived car t's and to be able to target whatever cell type, whatever antigen you're interested in, in the body. I think the sky's the limit for this kind of stuff. Agree. I'm, I'm waiting for the Nobel prize for the CAR T. I know immunology has had its day already in, in the, in recent, in this past decade, but CAR T deserves its, uh, its uh, turn. Um, sticking with the off the shelf therapeutic idea. I've got another really high, I mean, we're living in the golden age, Arun. Every single episode, we talk about these things, which, you know, we're on the cusp of treatment. And this is another great example uh, in the pancreatic islet space, which is one of the first targets and one of the most prominent and I think promising. But perhaps, you know, a lot of people would say that we've, we've, we've been waiting a long time uh, to kind of materialize those goals. Um, and here we are a step closer, you know, we've been talking about pancreatic islets for, for a long while, but diabetes and insulin, it's been understood for, you know, a century. We, insulin was discovered over a century ago. And because of that fundamental uh, insight, we were able to generate therapies for diabetes you know, we got these glucose monitors now, insulin pumps, these closed loop, loop systems that are highly efficient, that uh, really improve the quality of life of diabetics. But it, none of these are cures, right? They're all treatments. And that was the great promise of islet transplantation. And in fact, islet transplantation, it's used, you know, we use cadaveric islet, islet transplantation to effectively cure or, or to really robustly treat the condition. But Transplant from a single donor is often not enough, right? It's like cord blood. You often have to combine um, uh, donor samples from multiple, two, three, even more islet infusions going for around 1 million island, islet equivalents for your typical, you know, recipient, adult recipient. Um, and, you know, that's tough. It's not always in one bolus. You can have repeated surgical interventions, 
uh, then you'll have to have multiple rounds of the robust immunosuppression that has a lot of side effects. Um, so of course, one idea is to pool like they do with cord blood. You'll take two bags of cord blood, you combine them, you'll reach the threshold, you treat the person, they walk away. Uh, that's one idea, combine islets from multiple donors, but it's not like these things are coming off the pipe every day, right? You got to wait for somebody to, you know, succumb to their disease or whatever, and to donate those islets doesn't happen all the time. Um, so you need to stack them, or you can culture islets for extended periods, but, um, you know, weeks or so. But a lot of groups have shown that that the islets kind of go bad, they reduced endocrine function. So for that reason, the, the clinical trials that have been used, they limit the culture period to two to three days before the transplant. And, and this is a challenge. It's not just for cadaveric islets, but also for stem cell derived islets. It's the same thing. You know, you can generate them, presumably unlimited supply, but the idea that of taking them off the shelf is challenged by the, the fact that cryopreservation of even pluripotent stem cell derived islets doesn't lead to tremendous recovery. Um, and also in the pluripotent stem cell space is another issue, which is that there's a lot of variety in the composition of those diffs, right? So you got to do really like robust um, and rigorous batch to batch validation of each lot. You got to expand them, freeze them, verify, and then you can use them. And any kind of culture uh, there will also deteriorate the, the chance. So what do we need? We need cryopreservation, right? This is, I think, I, I don't want to call it a methods paper because I think the implications are so strong, but it is effectively a very rigorous deconstruction of all the, the parameters um, involved in cryopreservation. And the key here, it's not slow freeze. They actually use vitrification, which is uh, ice-free, zero crystals, um, which has been shown uh, in in IVF, it's very close to home for me because in reproductive medicine, we use vitrification exclusively for freezing small tissue, right? Uh, small groups of cells, embryos, uh, oocytes, sperm. But when we try and freeze large pieces of tissue, uh, it doesn't really, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit well with the vitrification. It's hard to get that ice-free freezing. So we use slow freeze. So this hit really hits close to home in what a challenge it is to get, uh, units of tissue cryopreserved preserved and then recovered well and they really went at it here uh, with really rigorous methods bottom line they showed that they could get robust cryo -preser preservation of mouse islets uh, pig islets also human islets as well as human stem cell derived beta cell islets so it's everything you could want they get uh, roughly 90 percent recovery after vitrification and rewarming which is really high um, they show that the, they look normal, you know, macro microscopically, also ultrastructurally with electron microscopy. And then, of course, this is the, the, the end of the day. And the most important thing is that they show normal glucose responsivity and insulin secretion. They function in vitro and vivo. They make insulin in these xenotransplant models. That's the pig and the human uh, stem cell derived islets in these xenotransplant models. They work, and most important here in the mouse syngeneic model, they cured diabetes fully. And this is a day after you transplant. Ninety-two percent of these mice are cured, Arun, um, and sustain this glycemic control for around 150 days, which was the end point of the experiment. So I think this is huge, uh, and this is, I think, the, the the grind that few people appreciate. You know, it's like. Uh, uh, what is it, the rock inhibitor, you know, Y27602. It's one of these things that just the paper goes out, move, everyone moves on with their life, but every single person uses a method. These guys decide, they, they defined the vitrification warming protocols here, and I think everybody is going to use them forthwith. Um, and uh, I think a lot of people are going to be cured. So this is a very exciting time to be alive, Arun, much less in the diabetic space. This is great. This, like you said, this is a super important paper, and I'm glad you brought up rock inhibitor, right? That's a one of those seminal findings in the stem cell field, which has made a tremendous impact in cell survival and cell preservation for all the cells that we work with. Perhaps our friend Ilya Sinjak, who was on the show 
a few months ago might have something to say about this paper as well. But you're right. I think part of the reason I, I love this is it makes me wonder about the application of this particular freezing methodology to other cell types. As you had mentioned, you know, it's really important in, in reproductive medicine as well. It seems like it works there. And in the cardiac field, we definitely need ways to preserve cells and tissues from cardiomyocytes and cardiac tissues as well. So perhaps this can be applicable there too. I The other thing I wanted to mention, and this is actually something that we haven't talked about on the show, there was a really high profile nature biotech paper that came out early in March from a bunch of folks, uh, actually one of the folks on the paper was Pekka Katiisto, our, our friend from the show. Uh, this is actually functional metabolic and transcriptional maturation of human pancreatic islets derived from stem cells. And in my opinion, you know, this Nature Biotech paper, this is perhaps the most advanced stem cell derived islets we've ever been able to make. These are pretty much one-to-one -one on par with primary adult islets. And if you think about it, Perhaps this particular study that you're talking about, this methods paper, can be combined with these super mature islets to definitively cure diabetes. I mean, that's the dream, right? That is the dream. But we have so many of these papers that are coming out in this field over the last couple of years that it makes me think this dream is becoming very close to reality. And I'm not typically one to, to hype up these type of studies and these these type of fields, but we are so close. I really do think we are so, so close into really ending this disease. And again, it's part of it is bringing these therapies, which are of course expensive. Cell-based therapies are not cheap. Bringing these therapies to the millions and millions of people around the world who actually have uh, various forms of diabetes, right? That's the, the next big step. But when it comes to the science, I am hyped. I am hyped about this type of work, Dale. That's exciting. And, and you said it, this could apply to a lot of different uh, tissue types, because that's, that's the thing, right? We can't make whole organs, but we can, we're really good at making these little mini livers, mini islets, whatever you want to call them. Um, so the grind of this group here, and I should mention, I didn't even mention the authors, my apologies. This was uh, led by John Bischoff and uh, Eric Finger, who are uh, mechanical bio, biomedical engineer and surgeon, uh, respectively, at the University of Minnesota, and all, all credit to them. This is this is takes so much work in the minutia, um, and it's the culmination, as you're alluding to, of decades of work. Um, you know, Doug Mountain, this story in the New York Times where they had a cure uh, of this guy, you know, n equals one, sure, but as you said, I feel like. We're coming to the pinnacle uh, of many years of effort and how gratifying uh, for it to take the form of, of perhaps treating and curing a disease that is so prevalent um, and is only becoming more of an issue in our society. Uh, so yeah, very exciting stuff. And I think reflective of the field in general, uh, which is another reason why I'm, I'm so excited to uh, get to the meeting this year in person. I feel like it's been long enough. We're going to show up and things that the last time we were in person at a meeting, we, we thought were so far away. Suddenly we're going to have cures around the corner. So I can't wait to get there, Arun, and share your company as well as the company of our guests, which we'll be talking with soon. But before we get to that, I have a quick message from Stem Cell Technologies. At the beginning of 2020, Stem Cell Technologies conducted a survey asking scientists to help highlight the needs and challenges in the human pluripotent stem cell field. Read the survey results to learn about the most interesting insights on topics such as irreproducibility and quality control and how to address them in your research. Visit www.stemcell.com slash HPSC survey results to learn more. Now, without further ado, let's get to our guests. All right, everybody, for this special episode of the Stem Cell Podcast, we have with us the leadership of the ISSCR to talk about the 2022 annual meeting that's coming up in just a little while. First, we have Dr. Melissa Little, who is CEO of Renew and professor at Murdoch Children's Research Institute, also the president of the ISSCR. We also have Keith Alm, who is the CEO of ISSCR and Dr. Amanda Clark, who is Department Chair and Professor of Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology, also the Scientific Program Chair and Vice President of the ISSCR. 
The three of you, thank you so much for joining us for the show today. Yes, thank you so much for, for joining, joining us here on the show. It's, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun talking about the ICCR upcoming meeting. Of course, it is a hybrid meeting. We're just a few months away from the annual meeting. It's always a highlight for us here on the Stem Cell Podcast. We've actually covered the meeting extensively here on the show virtually over the last couple of years. And we are so excited that it's finally, it's looking like, fingers crossed, that we'll be able to see everybody in person, hopefully in San Francisco. Although, of course, the ISCR has a virtual option for the meeting and in-person registrants can take advantage of the digital platform too. And we'll get to that in a little bit. So let's start things off pretty broad. We wanted to get your opinions and your thoughts about the upcoming meeting. What are you the most excited about scientifically? Otherwise, tell us what you think. So we'll, uh, we'll start with you, Dr. Little. What are your highlights? What are your hopes for this upcoming meeting? Oh, I think my hopes are very similar to the rest of the stem cell community. It's just going to be such a relief to have this meeting in person. It's been a long ride for all of us in COVID and ICCR. We've tried very hard to keep this community together virtually, but it really is difficult to beat that face-to-face -face experience. And so to be able to have a face-to-face -face meeting again is just a joy. It's also a very special meeting for us. This is our 20th birthday. Uh, and so to be able to have that face-to-face -face is going to be a lot of happy people. Um, I think probably breaking all COVID protocol, a lot of hugging, a lot of drinking. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and, and that's just really, it, it, it really has been the experience around the world that it has been challenging to keep those scientific conversations going when when you when you're virtual. Yeah, I agree with you completely, and especially for the trainees, I think it'll be really nice to have some of the trainees, you know, interacting with each other and with some more senior folks in person. It's it's really an exciting time. So, how about you, Dr. Clark? What are you the most excited about? Oh, I think it's definitely the trainees having the opportunity to interact with each other uh, and also to interact with um, established investigators again. So to me, the pandemic is where our trainees had lots of opportunities for virtual meetings. And I know a lot of our audience out there, um, our trainees um, attended a lot of meetings virtually, uh, but there's nothing like a face-to-face -face meeting, especially for our poster presenters. And that makes up a pretty large proportion of our attendees at the annual meeting, that they'll be able to stand in front of their poster, those that are attending, of course, there's a virtual option, those that are attending, and that there'll be, um, there's aims for people to visit their posters and to get excited about stem cell science uh, together in one room. So it's the trainees I'm most excited about. Absolutely. And how about you, Keith? What do you think? Uh, yeah, I've got to agree with, uh, with Amanda and Melissa's thoughts too. I mean, just the thought of having the community back together uh, in person is exciting. And there's, there's so much energy with, that, that comes with, uh, with having uh, our community together. And so I think we're, we're all very eager uh, to, to be back there. Um, and, you know, and, and before the meeting, even I, th I think the thing that's, that's been fun for us is just to see the level of excitement from our community to, uh, to have the ICCR back in San Francisco for, a, for an in-person uh, annual meeting. Yeah, I'm really excited. I mean, the last meeting I went to in person I, was uh, Los Angeles, but the meeting I went to, I think it was a decade ago, was in San Francisco. It was such a blast. I'm with you, Dr. Little. I think the COVID protocols are going to be uh, stressed, if not strained to the breaking point, but it's worth it. It's been a long time coming. Um, this meeting this year, it's organized into five main themes, and that's to help attendees find and connect with uh, researchers with common interests. Um, can you elaborate a bit on this format, Amanda? Also, uh, just as an ad, I was really excited to see the inclusion of 100 abstract selected speakers planned for the meeting. Make a note, listeners, the call is open for late-breaking abstracts until March 23rd, so get those in. But generally speaking, it feels like year after year, the emphasis is being placed on raising the vis visibility of newer and or less prominent investigators. So, Tell us about these efforts. Um, have they borne fruit uh, in years past? Uh, and how do they benefit the society as a whole? 
Uh, that's a lot of questions and, and I'm excited to start and then I'll pass the ball on to my colleagues on, on the podcast. So, um, so the idea to change the format for the um, annual meeting began before the pandemic. So there's already discussion that uh, our community is very diverse and that people attend the ISSC annual meeting for different reasons. And so the annual meeting uh, should potentially be organized into themes to help organize uh, the, 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 the way uh, you attend the meeting. And so we have these five themes. This will be the first time the annual meeting uh, will be running these themes in person. Last year, we did it virtually. So now we're doing it in person. And the five themes are uh, cell identity, clinical applications, uh, mechanisms of development and disease, new technologies, and tissue stem cells and regeneration. So there's something there for everybody. And by organizing the meeting around the five themes, if you're particularly interested in cell identity, then there's a pathway for you through the whole meeting. Uh, but the meeting's unified around the plenaries. So the plenary meet, the plenaries are sessions, there are five plenary sessions uh, that uh, encompass these themes. And so everyone comes together for the plenaries and then people can separate out into their tracks for the concurrent. So that way it creates meetings within a meeting. How about you, Melissa? Talk about these uh, abstracts. It seems like the, the volume of abstracts that are being accepted for speaking um, is increased. Is that just my imagination or is that really a, a deliberate effort uh, on the part of the leaders? I think there's very much a deliberate effort. Just following on from what uh, Amanda said, this concept of a meeting within a meeting was uh, something that we really worked on as a society as a plan. It didn't, hasn't rolled out quite um, as overtly perhaps because we've been virtual for the last two years, but it really uh, it really speaks to the diversity of the community within ISSCR and it, it's really designed to address everyone from the really fundamental biologist right through to the person wanting to put cells into man and giving them a community within the community to interact with. Uh, I think the, the deliberate decision to really uh, ensure that we had representation in the concurrent sessions from abstract presenters is also a very overt um, desire by the society to have participation from its its members uh, and and I think you know it's we, we are at the moment reviewing uh, our society and really going out to our community and asking what they want but there's been a consistent desire for people to to be a part of that meeting and and I think this is a very important way of doing that so let's talk for a minute as to the reason why we're, of course, doing things virtually slash in person, this hybrid format. And that's, of course, because of the pandemic, right? The COVID-19 pandemic, which has impacted the not only the stem cell field, but of course, the entire world over the last couple of years. And we would be remiss if we didn't talk about it at some point on the show. And I, I wanted to focus especially on the its impact on the stem cell community over the past couple of years. I think the field as a whole has really risen up to the challenge scientifically. If you think about all the different technologies that have been adapted to studying COVID-19 and the mechanisms of infection, uh, publishing all these different types of studies focusing on the mechanisms of COVID-19. Um, so uh, as leaders of the ISSCR, could you reflect on how you think the ISSCR, the society, and the field as a whole has really adapted to these challenges and like risen to the occasion? And in particular, maybe what you're the most proud of of how the field has responded. So Keith, do you wanna, do you wanna give it a shot? Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to. I remember so well in, uh, in the beginning of, of 2020 or, or, or about this time of 2020 Googling, you know, what is a virtual meeting uh, and, and, how do you, and how do you put that one on? And, and reflecting back uh, on that now, it's pretty, pretty hard to believe because it's something that we've just kind of lived and breathed for the last um, couple of years. You know, for the ISSCR, I think what's been fun about it is that we've learned that we can engage more members of our community than we ever have been able to before and giving more people access to, um, to, uh, to research and, and, and content that ISSCR offers uh, through our membership. And, um, you know, I think uh, along, alongside of that, it's really enabled our community to be engaged with each other throughout the year as opposed to coming together for the annual meeting or just for an international symposium or two, but 
but to keep the, the, the community together year round. Um, and so the digital programming uh, has been, you know, I think, yeah, you asked about what we're most proud of. And I think, you know, just from a, you know, from a community standpoint and society standpoint, we're proud that we've, of what we've learned and that we've been able to do this uh, so well over, over the last couple of years. And, and as a result, you know, we have gone from a society that, that has a couple of ways of engaging throughout the year at meetings to really having scientific programs that run, you know, every month, if not sometimes every, every week. Yeah, absolutely. And something you mentioned there, I really want to highlight the accessibility, the improved accessibility of not only the, the, the society, but sciences in general by shifting some of these things to virtual programs, virtual symposia. I think it, we're joking about, oh, we can't wait to see everybody in person, but I think it's been really beneficial, especially for trainees to have this increased access to content just by logging onto your computer and going to an online symposium. I think there's, it's been sort of a blessing in disguise in some ways. Of course, I, I still want to get back to in person, but it's been, the accessibility has been a good thing overall. I think that this is something that the ISSCR will continue to offer and, and build upon in the future because that accessibility is so important. Um, and so we can talk a little bit later about some other ways that we see, uh, you know, extending that digital programming. But uh, really, I think, you know, that's one of the things that's exciting about the annual meeting is that this is an opportunity to take all the lessons learned in digital programs and virtual meetings over the past couple of years and apply them, uh, I think, in a way that will enhance the experience of the people that are in person and the people that are uh, they're tuning in virtually. Yeah, absolutely. And when it comes to the the scientific side of things, of course, there's the the technical part of adapting to the virtual realities, right? But also the scientific uh, goals and the scientific achievements of the stem cell community during the pandemic have been pretty tremendous. So when it comes to the the science, what are you what are you the most proud of, Dr. Clark? Well, very early on in the pandemic, it was recognized that the stem cell community had something to contribute to understanding uh, the disease uh, that led to um, uh, COVID-19. And so, uh, so very quickly, the society organized to create a virtual meeting uh, that was specifically on um, COVID and what scientists around the world were doing in order to um, understand in infectivity, understand effect in particular on organs. And it was uh, amazing to see the community come together so quickly and share ideas. Melissa was very involved in this. So I think Melissa probably has more to add about um, the virtual community coming together in order to understand the disease of, of COVID-19. Thanks, Amanda. I mean, I think that stem cell researchers across the globe have really participated in this. Certainly uh, locally, we were very much in, engaged in it. Uh, I think that, you know, this is not unique to the stem cell community, uh, the scientific community globally was trying to make, make a contribution to our world needs. But I think that the unique nature of being able to build models of human tissues from stem cells really gave an edge in terms of our understanding of what was going on in this disease. Uh, and just following on from the previous conversation around how we've engaged, uh, I think this has really been uh, a fantastic learning opportunity. And sometimes you need a bit of a kick in the bum. And this one really was. Uh, for us to say, actually, how do we how do we share knowledge between our members in this period of stress? And the the regular uh, webinar type format that is now a part of what we do um, all the time has been just so successful at engaging with our members that we will certainly not be letting it go. And so the decision to make a hybrid meeting this year was not because we were worried, well, we were worried whether the pandemic would be over or not, but it was to ensure that we continue to use that ability to network without people having to physically move because we are not all able to move even prior to COVID. And we're an international society. So in terms of uh, enabling uh, involvement and uh, diverse inclusion from across the globe, we really are now recognising that this has to be something that's just bread and butter for the society uh, and not just rely upon the assumption that everyone can come to one meeting a year in, in person. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a, a sea change across the board, right? And for me, at least an inspiration uh, you know, we solved it, right? Not we, but the scientific community with the vaccine. But I think it was a nice, uh, a nice 
measure of how the community could come together towards a singular goal. And, and we did in stem cells too, as you guys are alluding to. I wanna circle back um, to the technical pivot. You know, All meetings pretty much has pivoted pr pretty abruptly as we were talking about. And notwithstanding the, the significant growing pains, you know, a lot of the, I think I, I, I lost the substance of a lot of talks in the last couple of years because of technical issues and some of the mortification, vicarious mortification and looking at these speakers, you know, speak mutely into the, into the screen was crushing. But there's a lot of positive changes that were introduced. I think we've talked about that a bit here. Um, but it feels like, as I said, this, this year, it's going to be a meeting, a whole thing unto itself, right? It's not pre, it's not the virtual, it's something in between. Um, Keith, is there anything that you, you can tell us about your expectations for the format? Are there any new wrinkles that we haven't seen before that you want to highlight? Also, I, I want to talk briefly about this. I, ISSCR has developed, and we've been alluding to this, this new digital platform that'll connect the global community through access to scientific content and networking capabilities um, with these upcoming programs that are on imaging, spatial transcriptomics, cellular barcoding, um, also this first international symposium in Jerusalem. It feels like, you know, it's, it's a, a lot all at once, you know, it's really forced the issue, the pandemic, and now we have this whole new world, this virtual world. I don't want to call it meta because I think that's not going to go so well. I think it's better than meta. The question is, how do you expect these digital offerings to advance the, the society's mission? You know, what's what's the end game there? Yeah. So I think, I mean, from from a mission standpoint, I mean, I think this this increases opportunities for collaboration and connection, you know, and sharing of resource across our communities. Um, you know, I I also think back to the point about accessibility. I mean, this now really opens a world for anybody who is interested in, in, uh, in, our, in our research. Um, so I, uh, you know, as far as what to expect for the annual meeting, um, you know, if, if you are, the goal here was, you know, there's a lot of organizations that are kind of creating, they call it a hybrid event, but you know, it's, it's, it's part, you know, what's done in person and part purely, purely virtual. We really, as much as we could, wanted to bring the virtual audience into the meeting. Uh, now there's some sessions and like networking uh, um, lunches and things that are not going to be available virtual, but but almost uh, almost all of the sessions will be available uh, virtually. Um, and there's some interesting uh, ways that we've also tried to kind of connect the virtual audience with the in-person audience. You know, so there's things like posters. You know, poster presenters have the option to do posters virtually uh, uh, as as well as as in person, and it's designed so that people. You know, can you know can collaborate from the in-person world to the virtual world? Same thing for same thing for the exhibitors. Uh, all of this is being built on one common platform. What we saw early on is that when we built a a, uh, a a virtual event, whether it just be a Zoom webinar or whether it you know be something like a you know uh, an annual meeting, that those meetings took place and they kind of lived on an island up there, and then the the you know the conversations kind of went away when the meeting wrapped. And so the ICCR vision, what we'll be uh, launching, it should be launched by the time this airs, uh, is a platform called ICCR.digital, which is one common platform for all ICCR programs, whether they're live or on demand. And the vision for it is to kind of combine a social media, LinkedIn type experience with kind of a Netflix on demand viewing uh, experience. And I think it should be a very powerful tool for the community. Yeah, and something you alluded to, I don't think this is going to be going away anytime soon. And I think that's that's a good thing. It comes back to the idea of accessibility and bringing content to as many folks in the scientific community as possible. I think that is the the ultimate goal and the dream. And I think it's the right way to to approach that. So I wanted to to shift a little bit towards more more towards something that the ICCR is really passionate about, and that's clinical translation of stem cell therapies. I mean, it, this has been a long time coming, it seems like, but the last few years have, it's really felt like the clinical promise of stem cells and regenerative medicine has been inching towards reality. And a lot of times it's more than just inching, it's really moving. Um, here we are, you know, recognizing ICCR's 20th year Year. That's like celebrating 20 years of translational innovation, right? And of course, this year's presidential plenary has the founding president, Dr. Lenzon, and also the most recent president, Dr. Christine Mummery, as bookends. I'm really looking forward to their reflections on the last two decades of the ICR. But 
how do you think the rest of that session and kind of the meeting as a whole is going to showcase the really rapid process that's been made, you know, the, the rapid progress that's been made on, on clinical translation? And Melissa, you know, as, as the incoming president, incoming ICCR president, perhaps you'd like to weigh in first. Well, I am the ISCCR president, I'll be outgoing at that meeting, but I'm very <laughs> pleased to be the president for this meeting. And as you say, as you've pointed out, we are really going to highlight the contributions of all of the past presidents that have really made this society. Uh, I'm very excited about how this society has moved towards clinical translation. It has been something that we have hoped for a long time, and uh, we are celebrating that in a number of ways. I mean, we, we, we have a Tuesday workshop specifically focused on clinical translation. This is something that has been introduced some time ago now, but it's just growing in terms of the desire of our membership to attend this workshop. We also have focused uh, focus sessions on the Wednesday morning before the main plenary that uh, look at some very specific issues around clinical translation uh, and are uh, promoted by uh, some of our sponsors. And we have all the way through the program an entire track around clinical translation and some phenomenal speakers who are the pioneers moving cells into man and uh, developing new therapies. Um, people like Lauren Studer, Marlon Palmer. Uh, and, and, and so I think that for those people who are interested in the clinical translation, this is going to be a very rich meeting and every year it grows in terms of what we offer. Absolutely. And how about you, Dr. Clark? What are you, what are you most excited about when it comes to the, the translational side of things? Yeah, so, um, so as part of this annual meeting, we have the opportunity of choosing uh, the topics for the plenary sessions. And so to further amplify uh, the direction that the society is going is we decided to dedicate two of our plenary sessions to clinical translation because it's it's such an important direction for us. So, um, so we'll be ending the ISSCR meeting on Saturday with the, um, with the second of the two um, plenary sessions on clinical translation that I'm really excited about. So, so this is where we're moving, and the and this annual meeting has really stepped up and is um, it's really um, presenting that to our society and our community. Yeah, I wanted to focus on that uh, final session there. On the flip side of the presidential plenary, we have the keynote um, to close, and that meeting is featuring Priscilla Chen of the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative, which is quote leveraging technology, community-driven solutions, and collaboration to build a more inclusive, just, and healthy future, unquote. I'm really excited for Priscilla Chan's uh, keynote address uh, to our ISSCR membership. We're so thrilled that she agreed uh, to, to be our final speaker. Uh, I think Priscilla is going to be inspiring to us because her story is just so fantastic that uh, that she she is a child of immigrant parents who came to the United States, uh, that she went to some of the best schools in the country. Uh, she's a physician. She cares deeply about science. Uh, she now has a platform to be able to discuss about why science is so important to society, why basic science and understanding fundamental science is key. So it's not just all about that final finishing stage and the disease, but actually understanding uh, uh, understanding science and in particular um, the importance of fundamental science. So I'm really excited about what, what she has to say uh, to our members, uh, but also her inspiring story. And I hope our trainees will really um, be inspired by her. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that talk too. And ISCR has had a number of pretty high profile guests over the last couple of years. I remember we had Tony Fauci a few years ago as well, right? That was a great, great session to, to listen into too. And so on the subject of translation and critical translation, the day before the meeting actually starts, there's this really popular workshop on clinical translation. It's a full day live program for those people who are interested in strategies to actually bring cell-based therapies from academia to commercial applications. So Keith, why don't you start off with this and feel free to kick it to Dr. Clark and Dr. Little as well. What really makes that program in particular such a success? Because, you know, this has been happening for the last few years and it's been, it's been quite a success. 
Yeah, it has been a success. And it's I know one of the things that our attendees look forward to, uh, you know, each, each year. I think Amanda said it uh, best earlier when she said, you know, it's, it's, so, uh, it's so indicative of where the field is heading and also uh, where the ISCR is heading um, it, it, as well. And so I think that's reason for its popularity as, as well. Um, I will let uh, Amanda and, and Melissa comment on it. Uh, in the past, I've always been in board meetings during, <laughs> during the workshop and clinical <laughs> translation. So I haven't actually gotten to attend yet. I hope I will in, in, in the future, but. This workshop is a really exciting one because the focus is about um, uh, immunotherapies, so uh, different approaches for um, for uh, immunotherapy using iPS cells uh, in order to make um, uh, those of the hematopoietic system that are um, important and required for um, fighting off disease, whether that also be um, diseases inside us like cancer. So it's a really timely um, place in, um, in the trajectory of this field to talk about um, how stem cells can be used uh, in order to fight diseases such as cancer and particularly around immunotherapy. So, so I think this is gonna be a really exciting workshop. So here we are celebrating 20 years on with a society that has shown explosive growth and impact, I think rivaling any society out there that's, that's devoted to basic science. Um, certainly a tough act to follow for the third decade and beyond. What is the mission for the next generation of stem cell scientists? I mean, from the top down, M Madam President, starting with you, uh, what is your vision, your hope for this next generation of trainees for them to get out of this meeting and to 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 rent you know ring out of the field in general are there are there any major pitfalls that we can anticipate and avoid maybe in terms of the translational front um and last question i know there's multiple questions if you can get to it all you guys uh is there a particular patient group or industry that you think stands to gain the most in the near term like wh what's the closest thing to the clinic in other words I think I'm going to start with the earlier points, you know, the, the ISSCR, and I think I've been to every meeting bar one in its 20 years of history, has is founded on, on research excellence and a fundamental understanding of stem cells and stem cell niches. And I think that's why it has been so important while we aspired right from the very beginning to see therapies come out of this. My hope for the future is that the society continues to drive that clinical translation out of high quality research. That's extremely important. And so training that next generation uh, in stem cell biology and showing them the opportunity to translate, I think is really important for historically in almost every field of academia, there has been a wall between that academic um, aspiration for uh, publication versus the translation. And I think what's very unique about ISSCR is that we're demonstrating that that fundamental biology is translatable and is critical. Uh, and I think that that's the role the society will continue to take. I think what's interesting is that you're asking who is going to benefit. Uh, we are now seeing cell into man from pluripotent stem cells in a variety of different conditions, and we can all name the most obvious ones, diabetes, blindness, Parkinson's disease. Uh, but I think that the potential is so broad uh, that it's, it's really very exciting uh, what might be able to come uh, in the future from different approaches to many different diseases. And I think the other thing that the society really can do, and this is why our digital pivot has been so critical, is ensure that that knowledge, understanding, and opportunity to translate is readily accessible across the global community and not just siloed up in, in the United States or in wealthy countries, uh, but, uh, but disseminated as internationally as possible. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned, like, and part of the question is who is going to benefit from the ISCR? And my hope is that everyone will benefit, whether it's a trainee, whether it's someone involved in the clinic, whether it's a patient. Hopefully, the communication and the discussions that we're having at the meeting and in the society as a whole will move forward the, the stem cell community and further the medical community as well. So, hopefully, we're all going to benefit. Absolutely. But can I just make another comment on that? And I think it's something that perhaps the, the junior attendee at our meetings is, is less aware of. 
the ISSCR has had an incredibly important role to play in policy internationally around uh, the policy discussion about sometimes ridiculous laws that impinge upon our ability to deliver from stem cells. But uh, we, we have also played an increasing role in outreach and education. Uh, and the Education Committee of the Society has really developed some uh, amazing tools that are now rolling out into, into South America and into other countries around the globe. We've had a very active and ongoing position around ethics and now more recently around standards in stem cells and have been actively uh, putting ourselves on the line around international guidelines for what is appropriate in stem cell biology. And the patient handbook has now been translated into, I think, about a dozen languages. And we have had our membership working with the community around what is uh, genuinely available for patients and what is not. Uh, and so managing and uh, highlighting those hype versus hope opportunities that are being exploited across the globe. And so I'm very proud of the fact that the society does more than just run scientific meetings. It is playing a really central role in ensuring that what is delivered from our researchers is not rubbish uh, and that the community is aware of what is really genuinely possible. Yeah, that's a really important point. As we all know, the stem cell field is, of course, entrenched in great science, but I think as a community, we have to make sure that the science stays genuine and stays rigorous. And uh, I know that the ICR puts out their annual guidelines, for example. It's been a, something we've actually covered here on the show as well. So we're, of course, very grateful to everything the society does, not only on the scientific level, but also on the ethical level as well, to make sure our field stays great. So thank you, all of you, for joining us here on the show. It's been a really cool chat. It's been Exciting to talk a little bit about the upcoming meeting. I'm, of course, very excited to attend in person. Can't wait. Um, but before we let you go, we wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, give some closing remarks. You know, what should, say, a trainee look forward to the most? Is there something specifically you want to highlight on the last couple of minutes we have on the show? We'll start with you, Keith. What, what are your closing thoughts? Well, I, I'd say, uh, you know, one of the things that we haven't talked about yet is a real focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion in this annual meeting. And I think that that will be an important uh, theme for the meeting. There's three sessions in the meeting. One is on an implicit bias um, training. Um, the second is, uh, is bringing together institutes and center uh, directors to talk about uh, some of what they've do done to address EDI uh, issues, uh, kind of, you know, practical advice. And then the third is also a, a meetup on uh, uh, um, diversity in cell lines as well. And so I think those are going to be a very interesting and important topics for the annual meeting, uh, and I'm looking forward to them. Yep, diversity in training and diversity in cell lines too. No, that's yep. both important points to talk about. How about you, Dr. Clark? What are you? What are your closing thoughts? There is something for everyone at this meeting. It doesn't matter if you're um, an undergraduate student who's interested in stem cells and wants to learn about the latest, greatest, coolest science, or maybe if you're a physician who is thinking about um, your, their patients and what is new out there in stem cells that could really help their patients moving forward, or maybe you're interested in bioethics and that you'd like to learn more about what are some of the issues that, that need um, further thought and discussion. So it's all there. So come and join us in San Francisco. I'd love to see you in person. Absolutely. And we'll give the final word to you, Dr. Little, as the current president of the ISCR. What are your closing thoughts? Oh, I just um, give a shout out for, for Amanda, who's done a fantastic job of bringing this agenda together. I'm particularly excited about the Presidential Symposium and it really was designed to bookend with, uh, with Len and with Christine as past presidents and then highlight some really exciting young researchers that cover the breadth of stem cell biology. But I'd also give a shout out for our award winners. We always hand out a series of awards and, and those recipients have award lectures. Sean Morrison is our Public Service Award recipient this year and he's done a phenomenal job for many for several decades now around the policy piece. 
The Susan Lim ISSCR Award for Outstanding Young Investigators is Jennifer phillips Cremens from uh, University of Pennsylvania, and she's going to give a fantastic lecture, I know. Lawrence Studer is the ISSCR Achievement Award winner and uh, is really leading in terms of clinical translation, and Joanna Weissocker is the ISSCR Momentum Award. So just a shout out to all of those winners. Uh, and yeah, I just can't wait to, to um, join the event. Yeah, neither can we. It's going to be such a great meeting and not least to which because we're all coming together after so many years, feels like forever. And, uh, you know, as you're talking about the award winners there, it really resonates. You know, these are the people as a as someone who began their career just around when uh, human stem cells were first derived. Uh, I mean, these are like rock stars to me. You've seen them growing up and, uh, you know, year over year you see these really august individuals who devoted their life to science finally get the recognition or another measure of recognition. But also on the flip side of that, you see the new entries, you know, you see the young scientists and these, you know, really talented postdocs with the abstract selected speakers talking about the next thing. And then you see them showing up year over year at, and with higher accolades and plaudits. It's, it's, it's such a great thing. It's such a great community. And it, it's so great to to have everyone coming back together. And thanks for giving us a, a bit of a sneak preview and peek behind the curtain on this show, guys. It's, it's really been uh, a lot of fun and uh, a fascinating take. So we really appreciate your time and all your efforts as uh, scientists, CEOs and the like. Um, thanks again. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. All right, guys, that brings us to the end of this episode, our ISSCR panel spectacular. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or by email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. Thank you guys for joining us for this episode. Be sure to tune in a couple of weeks where we'll have a fresh one for you.